As some of you know, I enjoy running. I've uh, had a habit in my life for a number of years and <clears throat> run a few races along the way. And uh, a couple of months ago, some of the guys that I run with, uh, we decided, we haven't been in a race in a while, so we decided to do a trail run in St. Louis that's going to be uh, next month in February. So we've been training. I've never done a trail run, and uh, I've run other races, as I mentioned, on pavement. And so we've been training a little bit, and yesterday I went out with one of the guys, and we went over to Klaus Park, and there's a three-mile trail run or a bike. Some of the guys ride their trail bikes over there and we were by ourselves and so we we hit it out there running the trail run and I've noticed that running that trail run it's a whole different experience where you have to really watch where you're going and with the leaves that have fallen it's hard to see the trail there are roots that are uh, underneath those leaves and uh, I was clipping along yesterday and on the first loop and we did two loops of that and and man I stumbled I hit a root or something and I went down and I I landed just, just like this on the ground, and I pop back up and, you know, kind of shake it off. You keep going, and this morning I woke up, and I want to tell you, there are places on my body that hurt like I didn't think could hurt. And I thought about what happened, you know, if I landed on a root, boy, I, and I'd been in the hospital. It could have been pretty serious, and the whole point of it is, is that, that I'm learning That with that kind of race, I have to really focus on each step. When you're running on pavement and you're running long distances, your mind just kind of goes into another zone and and your feet just naturally hit the pavement and and you're just cruising along. You don't even think about where you're stepping. But on this different race, this trail that I was on, that I had to really be careful because where your feet land is every step is different. It's true of our experience as Christians. Many times that we have had uh, a season in our life where the Christian life is just like hitting that pavement. It's just natural. And we don't even think about the steps that we're taking. Now, for some that can be good, but for others that can be a bad thing. Because we get into a monotonous state uh, in our in our spiritual life. Uh, we're in a rut. And we don't realize it. And then the pavement changes in our experience. The trail takes a different turn. And things that are underneath our feet we don't see spiritually. And it can cause us to fall. It can trip us up. And what I want us to do this year is I want us to get a real tight focus. As a church and for you as an individual. And what, what should be our focus for 2014? Well, I think it can sum it up with in this, that God's ultimate desire for every believer is to know and do the will of God. Now, we're here to glorify God. That's why we're created. But the way that we do that is to fulfill God's will. I think it's pretty simple. That God's desire, His ultimate desire for every single person, for every church, is to know and to do the will of God. But that can be a great challenge. It's hard to keep that focus because of the things that trip us up along the way. And I want to show you how we can do that. Jesus set the example for us in accomplishing the will of God. We find in John 6, 38, he said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Matthew 26, we find Jesus in the garden He is praying. It's before he's going to go to the cross. He says, God, if there's any other way for this not to happen, let this cut pass. Then he ends it by saying, not my will, but your will be done. Matthew 7, 21. There are those who've gone out and done these miracles. They've done great things in his name. And he says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does my will, the will of my Father in heaven. That's the, that's the person who is truly fulfilling his Christian experience, is doing the will of God. Now, how do you know the will of God? How is it possible that I know that I am doing the will of God? Great passage of Scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You see it on the screen. Let's say it together, all right? 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. Think about him in all your ways, and he will guide you on the right paths. All right? That's the Holman version. You may have memorized it in another version. It's a very familiar verse. But what I want to do very quickly is I want to help us understand how to find God's will, how to know and experience God's will. And then I'm going to really bring it down to application. And, and the big ask, I'm going to ask a, a big favor from you. And, uh, and it's going to be something that we're going to experience together over the next several weeks, uh, months, and years to come. And so I'm going to give you an assignment. There are two things I'm going to ask you to do as you leave today. That's why I was grieving. I want everybody to hear this. And so, uh, and so it's important that we catch this, what God is saying. Now, several things that we need to understand of how to know the will of God. First of all, consider the character of God. Consider the character of God. In verse 5, he says, trust in the what? Lord. Well, who is the Lord? If we're trusting in the Lord... Who is it that we're trusting in? Well, Henry Blackaby gives a great summary of the character of God. First of all, God is love. If you look at all the attributes and the characteristics of God in Scripture, you, you obviously see that God is a loving God, and His will is always best. If God's a loving God, His will is best. Why? Because He has your best interest at heart. Now, God is trying to do, I think, two things. He's trying to glorify himself in everything that happens in life. His ultimate goal is, is for, for himself to be glorified. But what God is trying to do is communicate his love to you and for you to love him in return. So when I know that God is loving me, that that's why I'm created, is to have a relationship with him he loves me that much that he wants to know me and to experience a relationship with him that his will is best for me because he has my best interest at heart. He loves you that much. So I am trusting in the one who loves me. I'm trusting in the character of God. Second characteristic is God is all-knowing. Omniscient is the word the theologians would use. God is all-knowing. That means that His direction, His will, is always right. His will is always right. Listen, God's will is always right. Period. God has spoken it in His Word. It's right. So God has revealed Himself in that He's all-knowing. I can go to you and ask for advice. There are people in this room who are very godly, have many years of experience. I, I, I count you great Christians, mentors of the faith. You're leaving a legacy behind you that I honor, but you're not all-knowing. You know a great deal, and I need to seek advice, as the Bible says, from you. But I also need to realize that God is all-knowing, and I need to go to Him first and foremost in my life to know what his will is and his will is always right for me third God is all-powerful omnipotent he is all-powerful he can enable you to accomplish his will I, I, I can't do what God is asking me to do I can't be that kind of Christian I can't be that kind of father you heard him say it. it. It broke him. His inadequacies. But God has empowered Billy to accomplish that part of God's will for his life. So that's what you need to realize that I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm not trusting in myself. I'm self-loving. I need somebody who can love me like no one else can love me my life my wife loves me my children love me my grandkids they love me but they can't love me the way that only God can love me there are things in my life that they can't they can't handle they can't resolve but God can so I'm trusting in the character of God and in that that means that God's plan is perfect Psalm 139 16 all my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. 
Hebrews 12, 1. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. It can be translated the race that has already been marked out for us. God's race is already marked out for you. He wants us to run it with endurance. God's, God's plan is perfect. God's plan will last to the end also. I'm trusting in the character of God. That means that he's going to finish what he started. Philippians 1, 6. He who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, until the second coming of Christ, or until I go home to be with him in glory. That he began that work, he's going to see it through in us. God also will choose the best things for us. God allows us to go through troubled times to test us, but God's going to desire and choose for us the best things. And, and here's, here's the way to understand that, Psalm 23. I, I was going to read the whole psalm. I don't have time this morning. Although nobody's going anywhere, so I really do have time. But <laughs> Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I don't lack anything in him. He, and if you read Psalm 23, all the things that he does for us. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It doesn't matter what we're going through in life. We know that God is with us and will give us the best thing. So I can trust the Lord. And here's why. Christ's character qualifies him to lead us. My character doesn't. My character cannot be fully trusted to lead you. I'm human. But God's character qualifies him and only his character qualifies him to lead you all right secondly how can i know the will of god seek to submit your will to his will the first five the first word trust trust him oh but i have the right to do this or that or whatever well when we become christians the bible says we've given up our rights we were the master now someone else is the master we were the lord of our lives now someone else is the Lord of life. We just sang it a few minutes ago. He's Lord of all. He's Lord of my life. So now I was a slave to sin. I have become a slave unto Jesus Christ. I'm a slave unto his will. So I am submitting to the will of God. Now our attitude is critical in that. Our attitude has to be an attitude that glorifies God. David said in Psalm 40 verse 8, I delight to do your will, O God. Now, can you honestly say that? Has that been your experience? It's hard for us to get happy about doing the will of God sometime, isn't it? God, you want me to do that? I don't want to do that. Or you're in the middle of God's will, and boy, I just don't enjoy this. I didn't think God's will was going to be like this. This is hard. This is hard. Well, consider your options. You can disobey God and not do His will and do your own will, and you're going to experience suffering like you've never experienced. I said this often, you're going to suffer either for doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing. Which is it? You're, you're going to suffer either way. I choose to suffer for accomplishing the will of God, for that's where the blessing comes. That's where the reward comes. That's where the joy comes when we're doing the will of God. The idea of submission, as I mentioned, is a tough one. Paul said it was a constant battle in Romans chapter 7. James 4 says this, James 4, 7, Therefore submit to God, but resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Third, your conscience is given to be an interpreter of God's will. God gave you a conscience. Verse 5, I'm trusting in the Lord with all my heart. Now God has given us three great revelations. First of all, in creation... Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says that God has created so that no man is without excuse. He is able to know God as we observe the creation. God has revealed himself through creation. Secondly, God has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. The first is general revelation in creation. We call that specific revelation in Jesus Christ. God has come to us in the flesh. John chapter 1 says that very clearly. 
That Jesus, who was God and was with God, became God in the flesh. Verse 14. God has also given us our conscience. Because that reveal that reveals God to us. It reveals God's will to us. It determines what is right or wrong for me. I'm able to know with conviction what I should do. Notice also God's word connects you with the mind of God. God has revealed himself through his word, but I wanted to save it for this point. And notice he says, verse 5, do not rely on your own understanding. Do not rely on your own understanding. Would you not be uh, honest with me and admit that when I've relied on my own understanding, I failed? Can you trust your understanding? Lean not, one version says, on your own understanding. Do not consider your own. Don't think about your understanding, your way. Think about God's way, as he says. Next, be sensitive to the place where God continually places you. Verse 6, think about him in all your ways, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I'm thinking about him in all my ways. Wherever God has placed me at that moment, I need to be doing God's will. Oh, I do God's will at church. I do God's will on these special things that I know that are spiritual in nature. But at work, i got to figure this out. No, at work, I'm doing God's will. At school, I'm doing God's will. At home, I'm doing God's will. When I'm driving my car, I'm doing God's will. When I'm enjoying life's activities, I'm doing God's will. Every moment, he says, think about him in all your ways. So I ask the question, how can I be used by God in light of my trials? In light of my past sufferings, how can God use me to encourage others? There may be somebody out here who's dealing with an addiction. This is what Billy has done. He has submitted to the will of God and used his trial to be an encouragement to somebody else. To prove the power of God in transforming lives. We can argue the word of God all day long, but you can't argue about that. You can't argue what God has done in that man's life. My talents and the spiritual gifts that God has given me. How can those be used to glorify God? When I look at the world's needs, how can I be used to accomplish God's will? We'll talk about that in just a moment. Then finally, notice the promise in verse 6. He will guide you on the right paths. He will guide you on the right paths. If I am trusting in the Lord with all my heart and I'm not relying on my own understanding, I know that God is going to guide me and place me on the right path. So that needs to be our focus as we enter in to 2014. So I need to ask myself, Considering God's will, do I really want to know God's will or just his stamp of approval on my will? As I said before, a lot of counseling is about people coming into my office asking me to put my stamp and approving what they've already decided they want to do. That's really what happens a lot of times. They've made their minds up, and, and so, Pastor, please agree with me that this is God's will. Rather than just simply saying, no, here's God's will. This is what the Bible says about your situation. It's the right path. So, do I really want to know God's will? Do I really want to know it? Secondly, do I really want to know God's will to obey it or to consider it? Please tell me God's will. God, tell me your will so I can think about this. Now, you said this, but how about this? Is it okay if I do this, although you've said this? And we start negotiating with God. God doesn't negotiate on our terms. It's on his terms, period. Have I the courage to do his will? As I said earlier, God's going to empower you to do his will. Because of his character. Because of who he is. He's not going to ask me to do something that he won't enable me to do. I don't care what God asks you to do, you'll be able to do it through the power of Christ. Now, there are five responses that you can have this morning. Number one, you can refuse. Like the rich young ruler, he had done a lot of good things, 
But Jesus, in this particular context, said, you got to go and sell everything that you have if you want to enter the kingdom of God. Now, he's not saying that everybody has to sell everything in order to be a Christian. That's not, what that, that, that's not how that's to be interpreted. For that man, in that particular context, he knew where his heart was and what was holding him back. He said, you got to sell everything. And what does the Bible say? He walked away, saddened in his heart. He thought he could do this to get into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus said, no, your heart's still not there. Your heart's somewhere else. It's with your money. And you can refuse to do the will of God. Secondly, you can be rebellious like Judas. This week as I was working on the sermon and reviewing my notes, I thought, you know, I really need to do a thorough study of the life of Judas. There's not a lot to say about Judas, but... I have a lot of questions. What, what was going on? We ultimately know that Judas was used as part of, the, a part of God's plan to bring him to be arrested and ultimately crucified. But, but what was going on in Judas? I mean, why, why did he accept? Why, what was going on while he was a disciple of Christ for those three years following the Lord Jesus? What, what was going on? We know that he was emotionally disturbed. He ultimately took his life as a result. But he was rebellious. He, 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 he rebelled against God's will. You can be reluctant like Jonah. Now Jonah was told to go to Nineveh and preach and bring revival. He said, no, he was considering God's will. And at that time said, no, I don't want to do that. Tried to go to Tarsus, got on a boat. Landed in the belly of a big fish. And so he finally came to terms. He was reluctant. Maybe you need to be repentant. Like David and Peter. This is God's will, David. David had an affair. Had her husband killed. But David repented. Psalm 51. Read Psalm 51. David's confession before God, his brokenness, his desire for God to restore him. Great, great passage. Peter denied Jesus three times. Hey, aren't you one of his followers? No, no, no. The last one, Jesus and Peter caught eyes. Think of that moment. But Jesus restored Peter. Look at David, a man who did the will of God. A man who sought after God's own heart, the New Testament says. Peter, one of the greatest pastors, one of the greatest evangelists the world's ever known. You can also be ready. Isaiah, hear my Lord, send me. Or Mary, be it unto me as you have said. I think that's one of the greatest lines in all of the Bible. Be it unto me as you have said. A ready heart willing to serve. Every one of these struggled with God's will. What will be your response? Now, what can I do to determine God's will and help others find God's will? Very quickly, the two things that I want us to do as we're leading into these days, the early days of 2004, the first thing is to pray, is to pray. The big ask, I'm asking you to pray, but I'm going to be very specific about that. I'm asking you to pray and I'm asking you to fast. For three weeks, beginning next Sunday, January the 12th, for those who haven't been here, I'm asking our church to experience the dawning. Three weeks of prayer and fasting, 21 days. And I want to take just a moment right now, and I want to help answer a few questions and get you ready and prepare you for next week. Uh, We have a guide that we have provided for you. It's printed. We have 100 copies. But if you have access to our website, we prefer you to go to the website so we can minimize how many of these we print. If you pick up one of these, there's one, we ask one per family. Now I'm counting on as many as possible in our church to participate in the dawning. And as you go through the dawning, uh, and I want to say a big thank you to Brad Rogers on our staff. Uh, Brad and Brian and I meet on a regular basis, and we theme out and, and do some creative things. And uh, Brian spent a lot of time, uh, Brad did, getting this put together for us and uh, did a great job. And so you'll see in here 
that there's a letter that is from me that helps uh, just talk about what we're doing and the dawning and, and why we're doing that. There's a table of contents and notice. Here's where you start. First of all, there's a prayer as you begin. You need to be doing this prior to Sunday. Don't wait till Sunday to pull this out. You need to go to the website. You need to start reading this this week. Then find your fast zone. We list different kinds of fasts. There are three primary fasts. We give sample meals of what those fasts look like. We explain how to start the fast and how to walk through the fast. And uh, the, 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 you will have to determine that. Some of you have health issues. You need to seek your doctor. You need to call the nurse who knows you and say, hey, our pastor has encouraged us to do a fast for three weeks. What kind of fast would be appropriate for me? Now, I, I'm desiring that those who do fast, fast from food in some way. Do one of these different types of fast. But some of you, the doctor may say, you cannot fast. You're on a strict diet and you've got to stay on that diet. I understand that completely. But you can fast from other things. You may fast from TV or from your uh, digital device or fast from some other kind of activity that is going, you're going to feel it. It's not fasting from something that, oh, I can give this up and you're not going to feel it. You know, when I give up food, I feel that. Or whatever it may be. But I don't want you to use that as an excuse not to do a food fast if you can do a food fast. I really want to encourage you to do that because that's biblical fasting. And so as we get into that type of fasting, God's going to reveal himself in a special way. We're creating space for God to reveal his will to us. How do, am I going to determine God's will is a time of prayer and fasting. So we go through these different types of fast. Fasting while nursing or pregnant. Fasting and, and eating disorders. Uh, beginning and breaking the fast. Creating your personal menu. Fasting tips. A sample fast, as I mentioned. We have devotionals. 21 days every day of devotionals that you'll go through and keep a journal. And it explains how to use a journal. There's a guide. It's called SOAP. S-O-A-P. An acronym of a way to do a journal while you're going through these three weeks of fasting. Uh, and, and so I want to really encourage you to go to this and go to the website, linwoodbc.org backslash the dawning. All right? It's here in the guide. Go to our website. And you'll be able to go right to it. You'll be able to see exactly what we're talking about there. Now, the big thing is no legalism. All right? Three weeks is a long time. Some of you say, okay, I'm committed, but pastor, in the middle of this fast, I've got this event, and it's just going to be real awkward and weird if I'm not eating something. I understand that, and I believe God understands that. I've got something that, for me uh, in a couple of weeks that is going to create a little bit of conflict for me, and I'm trying about how to figure that out and do that. So you'll have to do that, all right? But don't be legalistic about it. You know, it's the, it's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. But as best you can, try to follow along. I, I do the liquid fast. I did this in April with our deacon council and with our staff. We, we've gone through this. There have been a couple of ladies' Bible studies that have done this already. And so you will modify the fast. Uh, but I do a liquid fast, and I modify it a little bit because... I want to get in that fast zone, as he talks about uh, in the material. So I want you to drive you to that. Okay, so we're going to be praying. The second thing that we want to do is to serve. How do I determine God's will? By praying and by serving. I have found that one of the best ways for me to determine God's will is by serving the Lord. Start serving. And as a church, we're doing something very specific in serving our community that I, I've talked about in general, but... I want to get real specific with it today. And that is that we, we now believe that February 1st, we will open the Ruth House. I want you to see a picture of the Ruth House. There it is. This is the women's house that we've been talking about. The Greater Things vision, this aspect of the Greater Things vision is finally coming to reality. And I want to tell you folks, uh, I can't tell you how excited I am, how burdened I am. And uh, prayerful I have been for almost three years now since we first talked about it. God, 
God, I thought, was leading us in a direction to build out here and to start. But God led us another direction through a series of events. And that may ultimately be our experience. It may not be. But God has opened a door of opportunity where we're going to be able to open the Ruth House. This home is owned by a, 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 a person in our community who is very understanding and sympathetic to what we're trying to do. And this home holds up to seven women. Uh, there are several in it now. We're coming in, and we're going to be doing the ministry in this home. A lot of details about that. What's here, here important is this, that, that uh, you're going to have a vital part in this. And so there are three things that I want to mention to you about the Ruth House. Number one, uh, let me just a little bit more background. These are women in recovery they are going to be here. Most of the women that are going to be coming in here are from the uh, Family Counseling Center. And I learned something that was amazing. There are 150 recovery centers in Missouri alone. There are facilities like Billy talked about, going to the Gibson Center. There are 150 of those in the state of Missouri. And when someone comes out of that facility, they have no place to go, many of them. They don't want to go back home. They come to celebrate recovery. They stood right out here in the foyer and they told me three years ago, Pastor, this is a great thing because we, we can't go back or we'll relapse. We need some place to go. This is a facility to transition women. We're starting with women. And so uh, these are women who are in recovery. They, uh, we feel like, and, and, and those in the know have said, that really all of these in this house need to have the same issue, basically. Because there are certain issues unique to recovery uh, uh, persons that are different from others. Now, we have the opportunity on this street. The, the landlord said, if this works, you can go next door and open another house for women who've been abused. You, you, you can go next door and you can have another house. The women pay rent. Some of them have jobs, but we're going to help them find jobs. We're going to have a meeting January the 19th, two weeks from today. We're going to have a meeting at 3 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Men and women, we need help. We need grant writers. We're not using budget money for this. We're using donations and grant money. We need grant writers. We need uh, mentors. We need women who will come be a friend. We need people to help them learn life skills how to clean a house, uh, how to do other things, how to cook or whatever. Uh, we need to teach them how to find a job or find a place to live. Uh, so there are different ways that all of you can be involved in touching our community with the love of Jesus Christ. All right. So we have a meeting January 19th, 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Fellowship Hall. We we'll invite you to come. You can ask more questions, but learn more of how how to help these hurting women. Secondly, we need seed money. January the 19th, two weeks from today, we're going to take up a special offering. We're going to have two offerings that day. Our church is blessed financially. Uh, we had a great year this past year of giving and holding our expenses. God has blessed us. But we're not using budget money for this ministry. We created a nonprofit because there are foundations, Christian foundations, who won't give to a church. For some reason, they don't trust churches. I don't know. But they'll give to a nonprofit that's specifically designed for that ministry. And that's why we created it as a nonprofit. And so uh, we need some seed money to start immediately. We need about fifteen dollars to $20,000 of seed money. So I'm going to ask you to pray and to give as God leads you to give. If everybody does something, I have no doubt we'll easily meet that goal. But you pray and you determine this is how you can be involved. I, I can't go down there. I'm working. I've got kids or whatever. But I can do that. We also need a vehicle donated to the ministry. A suburban or a van that will hold seven or eight passengers. Um, because our vehicles are being used on Sunday and on Tuesday night. These women will be required to come to church on Sunday morning. They'll be required to be a part of Celebrate Recovery. They're going to be in Bible studies. They're going to have one-on-one -on -one mentors who are discipling them. Those women are already trained. Carol McKinney is leading that. If you have any questions about that, you can see Carol. She can help you with that. Carol, raise your hand. 
Right? I don't want a mob scene, but that's who she is, all right? And she can help you know that. But this is a holistic approach to what we're trying to do. So, so we're praying, determining God's will, and we're serving. And in that, this is a way that God speaks to me, is this my place of ministry? Is this the way I can touch the world with the love of Jesus Christ? Now, I want you to look at that house right there for just a moment. Get your eyes fixed on it. Because let me tell you what is going to happen that I know is God's will. Miracle after miracle after miracle. It's going to happen right there. It's going to happen. I know it will happen. Because I know what God's word has says. And I've seen lives changed by the power of Christ. We heard an example right here. And there are, think of it, think of the number of people who are coming out of these 150 recovery centers, have no place to go. They're going to come here. And they're going to experience the love of Jesus Christ because of you. Giving your money, your time, your treasure to touch somebody's life. Now think about what's going to happen here at Linwood. People are going to have a spiritual awakening through prayer and fasting in the Linwood community. And they're going to be women whose lives will be transformed by the power of Christ in the Cape community. It's going to happen here and it's going to happen right out there. Right around the corner is the men's house. It'll hold eight men. It's just sitting right there, and in the spring, as we learn through this experience, then we'll move into the ministry with the men. So guys, if you want to be a part of ministering to men, that's going to happen. My Lord said, there's the house. We can create an entire village, a community transformed, but more importantly, lives transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, the vision, it's as big as God allows us to participate in it. I believe it's God's will for our church. I believe it's God's will for those women that we know and experience God. We know his will and we obey his will. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? There's somebody here who would say, Pastor, The place where I need to start is that relationship with God that you mentioned. That's God's reason for creating me is to have a relationship. And I don't have that relationship. And this morning, I want that relationship with God. Well, first of all, it's believing that God loves you and allowed his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. But it also means you turning from your sin and turning to Christ. Billy, Billy helped us. He understood it all. But nothing happened until he let God transform his life. And he turned to Christ. He gave it all over to Jesus. He surrendered it all to him. That can happen this morning. You may not know what to do or say. You just come to Kevin or myself here at the front and we'll help you. Others of you know the Lord. But you would be honest in saying, I I don't know if I know God's will or if I'm doing God's will. But I want to begin the early days of 2014 by knowing that I am accomplishing God's will. That means that God is at work and we're joining Him where He's working. Prayer and fasting will help you. Serving will help you know God's will. Some of you, there are places in your life God is saying, hey, you need to let it go. You can do that this morning. You can trust in the Lord with all your heart. You can trust Him because of His character, who He is. There are others who need to become part of the church family here at Linwood. You've been visiting, you've been praying, God is leading you to be a part of what He's doing here. Others may just need to come and pray. Father, have your way in our hearts now. Help us to take that step of faith as we focus 
every step that we may accomplish your will. It begins right here, the first step. In Jesus' name, amen.